Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Emma Viglin off today. I want to welcome back to the program Kate Aronoff, staff writer at New Republic, focuses on uh, climate change. And Kate, uh, thanks for joining us. I've been, you know, talking about the cops, I guess, for, I don't know, 15 years about. And they seem to be going in, the, in, 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 in an odd direction. Uh, or maybe, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, well, they're going in an odd direction. I guess maybe the, the question is, um, what's that a function of, uh, welcome to the program. Tell us what, what is, what is, what is, what is we're cop 28 now. What is that? So cop, uh, refers to conference of parties. So that is parties or countries, which have signed on to the United Nations Framework Conventions on Climate Change. And so since 1995, uh, those parties have hosted a COP. And so this is the 28th COP. Uh, so they've been going on for almost 30 years. And uh, they are where countries come together and ostensibly figure out ways to deal with the climate crisis. And so there are different sort of uh, pieces within that. There's the Kyoto Protocol, which the U.S. is no longer a part of. The main thing that you've probably heard about and listeners have probably heard about uh, is the Paris Agreement, which was uh, signed at COP21 in 2015. And the U.S. is a part of and is, uh, as of now, the sort of main uh, agreement that is used to figure out how to uh, get emissions down to the goal of quote unquote well below two degrees Celsius. Um, who decides where these are going to be held and how relevant is that? Right. I mean, like, I'm just thinking like, you know, the Olympics, there's uh, like, it, it, there's sometimes it's tied into the locations that are trying to do development. There's problems with that, but uh, put that aside. Um, well, I'm curious as to like how they decide where it's going and what uh, the point of it is, because this one's in Dubai. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So each year it shifts between different regions. And so um, uh, this year regions uh, in the Middle East, I believe I'm forgetting the exact designation, but um, countries within those regions will put in a bid, which is what the UAE did uh, to uh, host the game, host the, the games. Um, right. Sorry. The, the UNFCCC is, um, we might say, a bit less corrupt than the IOC, uh, which is Arguably, the Arguably, right. <laughs> um, but the UAE put in a bid and they won. Last year, the talks were in Egypt, which, uh, of course, as, as many people reported on last year, has a pretty atrocious human rights record. Uh, this is not the first time uh, that uh, COP has been hosted by a major fossil fuel producing country. Uh, so in 2018, it was hosted by Poland. And uh, part of part of the talks is that there's all these sort of national pavilions and this big sort of conference like space and Poland's uh, pavilion when it was the host was made of coal. Uh, and it was held in a coal, historically coal producing city, Katowice. Uh, and so this kind of thing happens, right? So countries will put in these bids strategically. Uh, and as we'll probably talk about a bit more, it seems that the UAE's bid to do this was very strategic uh, in that the president of this COP uh, is also the CEO of the uh, state-owned oil producer <clears throat> for the UAE, ADNOC. Uh, and uh, recent reporting this week has shown that um, yeah, that they uh, have uh, reportedly been using, they deny this, but have reportedly been using uh, the sort of uh, standard order meetings that COP presidents have with different countries uh, to secure financing deals, to secure business deals for ADNOC, for Mazdar, uh, the state-owned renewable energy producer that uh, he also heads. He has a lot of jobs. Uh, and so there is a business calculation. For most, I would argue for, for most countries, there is a sort of economic calculation behind hosting these things. Right. Um, both for either the state-owned enterprises, for sort of economic interests for, you know, global visibility reasons. Um, and just, you know, it, it brings sort of business to um, two different cities. There's a lot of people coming in. There's 70,000 people coming to this COP. So there's always an economic calculation. I of think course. that of is course. more apparent this year than it has been well, maybe in any other COP. But, but I mean, I can understand the concept of w- we want to bid for this because we are, uh, we're, de- we're developing a nascent uh, renewable energy industry. Or because 
Um, if we can, um, you know, we're going to integrate uh, creating economic development in this city along the lines of something that is like, you know, with, with some type of green energy initiative. But the idea of of holding this in Dubai with the CEO of their national oil company in charge of like organizing this whole thing, it sounds like a, like a, like a bad comedy. I mean, honestly, it's like, what happens if we put an oil executive in charge of a climate change? Uh, uh, it, and then all of a sudden there's like some music and it's the craziest summer ever uh, type of thing. Like this is, I, I don't understand. Like how did, did not it occur to anybody at the UN or is this basically just sort of a, I mean, I get the sense from the report, your reporting and, and I've read the BBC's report on this. I mean, there's a lot of people reporting on all the different meetings that there is a sort of like, um, there's a capitulation here. Like we're going to, it's going to cost us as a world um, to transition. It's just like the way that we're paying for it seems also to be problematic. Yeah, I think it's important just to put the UAE in the context of how these talks tend to operate. And so there's there's been some other reports in recent weeks pointing out just how many fossil fuel representatives have been present at these talks basically since the beginning. Uh, so since 2003, over the last 20 years, uh, representatives from five of the biggest oil producers, Chevron, Exxon, Total, Shell, BP, um, have been given 267 passes to attend the talk. And if you include fossil fuel industry aligned trade associations, that number jumps to over 7,000, right? And so these talks have always been sort of seeping with fossil fuel interest. Uh, there are, you know, deals being made along the margins um, by governments, by businesses. Um, that has long been the case. I think it's it's not so strange to imagine the UAE hosting this if you consider um, what governments like the United States, uh, even the European Union, have been saying for a long time, which is that we want oil and gas producers to be part of the solution, right? That has been the sort of standard order line for rich country governments and for many non-rich country governments too, um, for you know about as long as these talks have been going on. I mean, the United States itself is, of course, a major, major oil producer. We're producing more crude oil than we have at any point in our history right now. Uh, and so to say that we, you know, welcome drillers to be at the table and figure out a solution is, is has been the sort of business standard line for a very long time. And so if that's the case, then there's really no contradiction between allowing the UAE to host a climate conference, allowing the head of ADNOC to host a climate conference, uh, and that line. And, and, you know, immediately after this was announced, uh, the COP28 presidency going to um, Al Jaber, the, you know, climate justice community was outraged you know, for very obvious reasons that you just laid out, which is that he runs a fossil fuel company and has an obvious interest in not phasing out fossil fuels, which will be the sort of conversation at these talks is this distinction between fossil fuel phase out uh, and phase down, which, you know, is, is classic sort of UN minutia stuff. Uh, but that, you know, is just how these operates and it's been until very recently a real minority voice within those talks to say we actually need to get rid of fossil fuels rather than using these sort of weasel words um, to say well uh, you know we can uh, suck up these emissions at some point in the not too distant future uh, we'll you know phase them down at some point and you know we have seen just study after study after study this year and for the last several years um, showing both that you know the problem with fossil fuels is very obvious that we're, you know, governments are on track to produce double the amount of fossil fuels and is consistent with keeping warming below one, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, producing 69% more uh, than is consistent with keeping warming below two degrees Celsius. Um, you know, you can rattle off the dozens of these sorts of studies. Um, but, you know, they have just placed more and more faith as the UAE is doing, as the United States is doing, notably as Saudi Arabia is doing, into these solutions um, like carbon capture and storage that might have some marginal use but are fully incapable of doing the sort of superhuman tasks uh, that fossil fuel producing governments say they will be able to do in short order. I mean, I can understand the concept of like you want them at the table because you want to sort of 
you want to deal you, you want to deal with their resistance to this right i mean you're you're fundamentally uh, assaulting their uh their business plan and uh trying to make their um their ability to get investment less attractive than the ability of uh of clean energy to get investment i mean that's basically the the broad strokes the sort of you know to the extent you know when we talk at a, a market level um uh, you know which i if it was up to me we wouldn't be doing it that way we would just nationalize all these things and, and whatnot but putting that aside this is the the world that we're dealing with it just seems like um you can go too far <laughs> with that calculation by handing over the sort of the the agenda to someone who's obviously like we've got all this money invested in this apparatus the uae is going out there and they're covering they're hedging their bets by but this is like basically going to um you know rj reynolds i guess uh back when they were making uh, cigarettes i don't know what name they're doing it now under altria or whatever it is and and saying hey guys um what do you think about like you know uh, investing in chewing gum instead of uh instead of cigarettes and them going well we'll, we'll cover our bets there too but if they're in the room negotiating these things they're going to exhaust every penny they can get out of their investments that are existing. And they're just going to mitigate whatever their number one agenda is. We're going to mitigate the, uh, the losses, or I should say the less than projected profits that we anticipate going forward. And then we'll give the money. And that's, that dynamic seems to be really problematic. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up tobacco, too, because notably, the World Health Organization has a conflict of interest policy, right, so that tobacco producers cannot be in the room when they are debating lung cancer. The UNFCCC does not have a conflict of interest policy, and it's only this year uh, that there have been new transparency measures introduced where employees of fossil fuel companies actually have to say they work for a fossil fuel company rather than that they're the guest of some nonprofit uh, that is coming to the talks as an observer. Uh, and so that, you know, creates these very obvious, uh, as you said, conflicts of interest. And I, I, I would say, you know, I, I am uh, like probably a lot of people skeptical about how maximally useful the UNFCCC can be. I think we've had, you know, nearly 30 years of evidence showing that um, it, the space really has its limitations. Um, there's very little money involved. There's a little, very little enforcement power uh, to, you know, make good on any of these promises. But um, you know, the same companies, the same lobbyists who are going around in national governments at the state level where things can actually be enforced are the ones who are coming to these talks, right? And so sort of at every level of the process, uh, it is being polluted by fossil fuel interests. And I think most, more sort of meaningfully actually at the national level, particularly in a place like the US where it's just sort of ubiqu fossil fuel interests are you know kind of ubiquitous uh, across the political system. From an activist standpoint, are they, um, I mean, is, is, is there a point where, where uh, the cops become, um, just unilaterally, or I should say 100% unhelpful. I mean, that they end up just being a, a greenwash, um, uh, you know, they just function as greenwashing and there's no, there's no upside to it from a, uh, from an actual like uh, activist standpoint, because it, it just seems like all their, th that these things are basically coming in to sort of, you know, basically say like, we're going to do a transition but it's not going to be until we literally squeeze every drop of oil uh, out of uh, this rock that we're on. And then we'll do the transition because it'll be financially viable for us as an oil company. The, the, like there's no other entity in the world that would have a least uh, a less uh, buggered notion of how to make that transition, it seems to me. Yeah, I mean, every year I feel like when I report on cops, somebody or many people will say to me, you know, this is the last year I'm done. Uh, it's so useless. And, you know, I think it's necessary, but not sufficient, right? And that there are very few venues for climate 
activists from around the world to come together um, to be in front of world leaders. Um, the Paris Agreement itself is arguably a really important document, right, that took a very long time to come up with, um, does provide the sort of outlines of this framework, a goal to hold world leaders to. I think there are a lot of uses to it. But ultimately, um, you know, as, as you will hear people say over the next two weeks as these talks proceed, real power doesn't really lie in the UNFCCC, right? Real power is held within places where there's capital, right? The World Bank, uh, within the IMF, uh, in national governments, wealthy countries like the US, like the UAE, like Saudi Arabia, even in China. Uh, ultimately, if something really is going to happen, it will be a product of countries actually doing something, which is the, you know, basically the structure of the Paris Agreement is that every country does its part. Uh, and so there are some uses to this process. I, I don't want to say that it's it's not you know um, it's not useful. It is you know one of the only sort of global institutions in which uh, countries, poorer countries, countries from the global south, sort of have a voice, have a legitimate sort of uh, institutional voice. But uh, yeah, this process really has its limits, and I think it's not it's important not to sort of expect too much to come out of it in any given year. All right. Well, fair enough. Um, I, I appreciate your explaining. I mean, I've just been reading this stuff and just thinking this is this seems nuts uh, to me. It is. It doesn't get less nuts the more you read about it. So, well, I appreciate uh, at least um, I feel a little more sane and then, of course, a little bit more depressed uh, about it. But uh, Kate Aronoff, always a pleasure. Staff writer, uh, New Republic. Uh, we will put a link to your piece on uh, or the one to, the the climate talks are crawling with fossil fuel honchos and flax uh at the uh our youtube and podcast descriptions thanks so much for joining us thanks so much